So with that, it gives me great pleasure to introduce our first speaker, Shirstin Afshoknik. Shirstin has been a representative on the ECB's supervisory board since the 1st of October, 2019. Prior to this, she was the first deputy governor of the Swedish central bank, Riksbank, a position that she held since 2012. In that role, she was also an alternate member of the General Council of the European Central Bank from 2015 to 2019. And she was also a member of the European Systemic Risk Board from 2015 to 2018. During 2009 to 2011, Shirsten was the managing director of the Swedish Bankers Association. And from 2008 to 2009, she was the chair of the European Committee, uh, the, sorry, the chair of the Committee of European Banking Supervisors. And prior to this, in 1995 to 2007, she was head of banking supervision at the Swedish FSA. It's also important to note that Shirsten has been a member of the Basel Committee on Banking Supervision. Many of us have been following their advice also in respect of in the internal audit functions. And she held that position during 2003 to 2009 and also from 2013 to 2019. So with that a very short summary of a very impressive career, I'd like to say a huge thank you for joining to Shirstin and over to you Shirstin, thank you. So thanks a lot for that nice introduction. It is a pleasure for me to be here today and I would like to thank the organizers for inviting me. 51 years ago to this day, the first computer to computer connection was established through ARPANET, the early forerunner of the internet. The first host to host node has evolved into this vast global network, which makes our virtual gathering possible uh, today with speakers and audience members tuning in from all over Europe. So it is a fantastic development. In my remarks today, I will discuss the challenges that the coronavirus pandemic has posed for banks and banking supervisors alike. And I will highlight the instrumental role that internal auditors can play in navigating this crisis. I will first recap the supervisory measures that the ECB banking supervision has taken. And I will also outline the intricacies hidden behind the clouds of uncertainty that currently surround the macroeconomic outlook. I will then discuss how banks can play a part in clearing some of the haziness ahead and plan for a sustainable future by considering digitalization and consolidation strategies. And finally, I will look further ahead and consider some of the challenges that are likely to lie in store for banks, including some old issues that will persist regardless of the, uh, what the future may bring. But let me start by outlining our supervisory response to the crisis. Since the outbreak of the pandemic, ECB banking supervision has been keen to communicate to markets, banks and other stakeholders the rationale behind the extraordinary measures we have taken. Our ultimate goal has been to help create the conditions for banks to be able to keep the flow of credit to the real economy as steady as possible. And this in turn should allow for the seeds of the recovery to be sown at an early stage. To this end, we gave banks significant capital and operational relief. On the capital side, we have allowed banks to operate temporarily below the level of capital defined by the Pillar 2 guidance, the capital conservation buffer and the liquidity coverage ratio. Banks have also been allowed to partially use capital instruments that do not qualify as common equity T1 capital, for example, additional T1 and T2 instruments to meet the Pillar 2 requirement. On the operational side, our measures included suspending the implementation of some of our supervisory decisions for six months and extending the deadlines for the implementation of some remedial actions stemming from on-site inspections and internal model investigations. And we also granted banks temporary flexibility in relation to their management of loan classification, 
And our goal is to help smoothen the implementation of the loan guarantee and loan moratoria schemes that have been adopted by national governments. And finally, to keep capital within the system, we recommended that banks suspend dividend payments and refrain from buying back shares until this, the end of this year. At the same time, we have repeatedly encouraged banks to take advantage of all the regulatory flexibility allowed by the current legislation and use their capital and liquidity buffers to absorb losses and lend to the real economy. Banks should not be concerned about being stigmatized for using their buffers or needing to quickly replenish them as we have also repeatedly reassured them that they will be given enough time to rebuild their buffers once the most severe period of this crisis is over. ECB stimulation sh simulations shows that the using of the buffers would support higher GDP growth and as a result credit losses would be lower and leading to higher profits also in the banks. But banks must be cautious and also play their part. I presume that there are many internal auditors now in the audience today. And with this in mind, I would like to highlight the instrumental role that banks' internal audit functions play in keeping the risk profile of banks in check. As the people in charge of providing independent assurance of the quality and effectiveness of banks' internal control, risk management and governance framework. It is your responsibility to inform the board of directors and senior management of any material issues identified. During uh, testing times like these, the primary focus needs to be the risk areas most affected by the COVID-19 crisis, namely credit risk, liquidity and capital planning, IT and cyber risk is in our focus and should also be in the bank's focus. Furthermore, it is fundamental that as internal auditors, you remain agile in reprioritizing tasks and are able to adapt your practices to a reality in which internal audits are performed mostly off-site and online. Let me reassure you that supervisors, we are firmly committed to ensure that the adjustments banks have had to make in response to the pandemic shock are a risk-based approach. These adjustments must not jeopardize the activities of the internal control function and its key role as an independent line of defense. And we expect banks' internal control functions to continue to have full access to the board, including in a remote working environment. In these critical times, our joint supervisory teams very much count on internal auditors, maintaining an open dialogue with them so that together they can ensure that banks' critical weaknesses and heightened risks are identified in a timely manner and that risk mitigation measures are duly implemented. ECB banking supervision is also playing its part in terms of risk identification. In April, we created a dedicated task force to assess the most pressing risks from this crisis and to identify the emerging ones. The aggregate result of this vulnerability analysis were encouraging to the extent that the overall capital shortfall in the most likely scenario would not stop banks from operating. However, we identified substantial differences across business models and banks, which suggests that some banks are bound to face serious difficulties in the future, even if the future is still clouded by a high degree of uncertainty. I will turn to this issue next. As the supervisors of the system, we knew that the euro area banking sector on aggregate was on a stronger footing at the start of this crisis than it was at the start of the great financial crisis 2008. The fact that the European banks were able to survive the first most severe hit from the crisis seems to confirm this notion. However, this does not mean that we are out of the woods, and let me explain why. 
First, although the expectations of the euro area future macroeconomic performance have recently stabilized, we must keep in mind that the overall macroeconomic environment is still subject to a high degree of uncertainty. The baseline scenario of our projections cannot be taken for granted and the possibility of a double dip recession cannot be rolled out yet as the new restrictions being implemented across the euro area to curb the current resurgence of COVID-19 cases will again increase uncertainty for households, corporates and banks. With such uncertainty clouding the macroeconomic picture, it is not surprising that the outlook for the banking sector itself is still unclear. The latest data on banking performance is dismal with banks return on equity averaging, averaging zero in the second quarter of 2020, down from 6% a year earlier. But it is difficult at this point to make an accurate prognosis on future Euro area bank performance as banks balance sheets remain somewhat distorted by the loan moratoria and the loan guarantees that governments have extended to bank customers and to banks themselves. Second, we must remember that the Euro area banking sector has itself been the beneficiary of unprecedented measures taken by different stakeholders to keep the economy afloat during the pandemic. In addition to our supervisory response, banks have also benefited from an extraordinary accommodative monetary policy, as well as from the other measures taken by fiscal and macro prudential authorities in different countries. It is difficult to disentangle bank performance from the combined influence of such measures and academics may wonder about the resilience of the banking sector had these not been deployed. From a policy point of view, however, the main question going forward is whether the pace at which these extraordinary stimulus measures are withdrawn will result in severe cliff effects rather than the desired soft landing outcome for the banking sector as a whole. Although banks are at the receiving end of the decisions by policymakers in different domains, there are still a few areas where the banks themselves could do more to ensure they are better prepared for the uncertainties which lie ahead. A number of European banks are highly exposed to the hardest hit economic sectors as of August 2020, roughly 10% of all loans to the most vulnerable sectors were covered by EBA moratoria and other COVID-19 forbearance measures. Of course, this does not mean that these loans will go sour, but it does highlight the importance of banks being proactive in guarding against potential cliff effects in the future. Thus, one area of focus going forward must be credit risk management, probably one of the most important areas. In the second quarter of the, this year, uh, there were, um, was only a slight increase in MPLs and the share of loans classified as being at risk. Of course, when government loan moratoria expire and default materialize, we expect the non-performing exposures to increase significantly. In an extreme scenario involving a second round of lockdowns, which is not the baseline foreseen at the moment, but in an extreme scenario, we um, foresee that the MPLs could reach 1.4 trillion euro in euro. And this would be higher than the peak registered after the great financial crisis. It is therefore important that banks complement the operational flexibility granted to them in relation to their MPL management with effective strategies for monitoring loan deterioration uh, that allow them to identify risks at an early stage. By engaging with potentially distressed borrowers in a timely manner, distinguishing viable distressed customers from non-viable ones, and adopting prudent provisioning practices, 
Banks can help to minimize potential cliff effects when moratoria are lifted. And this would also provide greater clarity on banks' balance sheets, particularly as regards the trajectory of asset quality, a key indicator used to inform realistic and reliable capital planning by banks. Having such elements in place would help us as supervisors in our review of the recommendation to suspend dividend payments, which will be completed in December. Although the pandemic has clouded the outlook for the banking sector and near-term developments are still subject to the high uncertainty, it has also shed light on some stark realities which are likely to be permanent features of the European banking sector in the medium term. Let me give you some examples. First, the structurally low profits of some European banks and their persistent inability to earn their cost of equity will compromise their survival in the medium term. The COVID-19 crisis has exacerbated this challenge, but the underlying principle still applies. Banks will need to continue to adapt their business models to the new circumstances if they want to ensure their sustainability including by securing sustained investor interest and through it access to capital. Second, it's also very likely that the trend towards digitalization becomes an underlying assumption in banks planning. Any viable strategy for the future has to consider significant investments in technology as essential for a bank to to uh, not just survive, but also to thrive. The pandemic has triggered a decisive push in the demand for digital products. Some of the expected unbundling of traditional services is already occurring and powerful new competitors are entering the market. Non-bank competition and competition from newly established credit institutions with specialized business models have never been higher with the number of applications submitted by institutions with fintech oriented business models increasing again in 2019 for the fourth year in a row. Taken together, this implies that banks must pursue ambitious digital transformation plans in order to sustain this, banks will need to thoroughly revise their cost structures or consider other revenues that will allow them to take on higher investments in technology while keeping profits afloat. Consolidation could be one way of dealing with this dual challenge. While also helping to reduce the current excess capacity in the European banking system. I'm happy to see that consolidation seems to be picking up in Europe. A new wave of mergers is taking place among Europe's largest banks, while consolidation among le less significant institutions is also continuing. The number of less significant institutions has increased by around 800 since the start of the European banking supervision in 2015. Third, uh, the nature of the relationship between banks and their governments will require continued attention by policymakers. Uh, though appropriate for dealing with the current crisis situation, extending government guarantees to banks and decreeing payment moratoria for banks' customers has temporarily reinforced the linkages between domestic banking systems and their respective sovereigns. And it was precisely this close association that took a particular pernicious form during the Euro area sovereign debt crisis in 2011 and 12. And it is the very issue that of the creation and the basis for the creation of the banking union. With governments increasing their supply of sovereign debt amid the pandemic and banks searching for yield and investing in sovereign bonds, this problem might become worse in the period ahead. Fourth, the COVID-19 crisis has shown the benefits of having pan-European structures to regulate and oversee banking activities in different forms. And this is true for significant institutions which are directly supervised by the ECB, 
and for less significant institutions which are directly supervised by the national competent authorities with the ECB in an overall role oversight function. Since the onset of the pandemic, the ECB and the NCAs have acted together in a swift and coordinated manner. In so doing, we have been able to refocus part of our supervisory attention on the immediate mitigation of the fallout of the crisis without losing sight of the medium term challenges that are likely to remain relevant for the banking sector as a whole. This outcome is testament to the valid validity of the banking union in Europe. But we most acknowledge that this structure is still incomplete and that progress in some of, of its constituent pillars is still lacking, especially as regards the common deposit insurance scheme. Work to finalize the work in banking union as political leaders foresaw it back in 2012 must therefore continue. So in conclusion, I hope that I have pers persuaded you that other banks were on a sounder footing going into this crisis and supervisors took action from the outset. The full consequences of the pandemic for both banks and banking in general remain to be seen. It is undeniable that in the near term, we will continue to wrestle with the uncertainty when devising our path to the future. In this regard, I have outlined that there is a case for coordination among different stakeholders so that the eventual withdrawal of the extraordinary stimulus measures provided to the banking system is as smooth as, smooth as possible. I've also argued that banks need to provide greater visibility on realistic asset quality and capital path projections trajectories to help super supervisors make informed decisions. And here, internal auditors have a role to play in promoting efficient and fair processes within banks. And lastly, while there are many known unknowns in this crisis, some elements are as familiar as ever. These include the need to restore bank profitability, overcome the challenge of digitalization, redress the relationship between banks and their sovereigns and complete the banking union. All of these topics are likely to be an integral part of any medium term policy agenda for us from a supervisory point of view. And regardless of what the future may bring, I'm convinced that we will be better able to address the challenges that lie in store if we do so through strong pan-European structures. Thank you. Thank you very much, Shirsten. I think a lot of food for thought uh, for banks, but also for us internal auditors um, there, uh, particularly given the continued uncertainty ahead. It looks like we do have around five minutes, if that's okay with you, uh, Shirsten, just to have a couple of questions. Um, if anybody has a question that they would like to put into Slido, please go ahead. Um, but I had a specific question for you, uh, Shirsten. I, I recognize that you've taken on a very important role just within the last year. It's been a very difficult year for, for everybody, I think, in, in Europe. And actually some of our participants on, on the in the forum today have also taken on new roles. I mean, what has been the biggest challenge for you personally joining the supervisory board at, at, at this time? And any advice for us? Yeah, thanks for your question. I, I joined the supervisory board in October uh, last year. So I've been there for a year now. And uh, over the uh, first uh, five months, I, uh, I was living in Frankfurt and uh, all the, the meetings we have every third weeks, they are uh, in Frankfurt or they were in Frankfurt. Uh, since mid-March, we have uh, just had meetings remotely so I think that was the first challenge to make sure that we could uh, meet uh, and have a good discussions. Um, it started with telephone conferences and uh, in the crisis we had quite a number of telephone conferences, uh, um, sometimes several conferences a day to discuss all the uh, important issues and uh, take part of the analysis that our staff made. 
since the summer period, we have been able to use WebEx and we have had the video conferences. And I think it makes uh, life a little bit easier when you see people. I mean, you are a little bit talking with your body language as well. So I think for now it works pretty uh, well, but I think we all think that it would also be nice also to meet in person. But uh, as uh, the uncertainty with COVID is uh, growing and um, in Frankfurt, I mean, there are more and more restrictions, not just at the ECB, but also in the society at large. I think this is something that we ha have to continue to work uh, remotely also for the, um, for the coming, I guess, months, at, at least to the end of the year, but maybe also longer. Now I cannot hear you. You are right. So uh, I need to learn to work virtually uh, and to be able to unmute myself. So we're, we're all, all still learning here. But just um, one last question, if that's okay, um, Just I think you touched on it quite a bit within your speech, but obviously um, we have a, a, a large group of internal auditors on the, um, on, on the call here today. I mean, in terms of the real focus for internal audit, you've mentioned some of the key risks. Um, which, which are the things that you think um, supervisory bodies and also obviously the, the JSTs will be looking out to um, check that internal audit has got a good, good handle on? Yeah, I mean, it is a challenging times also for our JSTs, and I know that you will uh, learn more about their work later on today. But I think we, I mean, as I mentioned, the credit risk and the capital planning is key for us to really understand. I mean, the quality of banks' portfolios and their possibilities also to make sure that they have enough capital for the um, uh, coming uh, period. And uh, as long as we have the moratorias and governmental guarantees in place, it seems like it's um, at least some banks are a little bit hesitant to, to uh, I mean, I, they, they find the credit risks in the portfolios and, and provision as the MPL level seems to be uh, not low, but uh, they are not uh, increasing uh, a lot yet. So I think that is a little bit our worry that there will be a cliff effect next year when the um, uh, guarantees are taken away. So uh, if you can help us here with making sure that the, uh, the banks are doing what they can to uh, make sure that, that they have a good view on the quality of their credit portfolios and the, the capital planning for the years ahead. Okay, thank you. So I think that's a, a clear message to the chief auditors there. Uh, let's uh, continue our strong focus on, on credit risk and capital planning, but also uh, particularly thinking ahead, as Shirsten said, about the, the possible cliff edge effect that, that could happen with the withdrawal of uh, the various government support that we've seen in, in, in many, if not all of our countries um, in, in the last year. So um, with that, Justin, I'd like to thank you uh, very much for having uh, joined us today. It's been a pleasure to have you. Um, it's great to have support from the supervisory board. It means a lot to the um, internal auditors in the European banks to know that uh, our work is also um, valued. So we'd like to thank you uh, so much for, uh, for joining us today. Thank you, thank you, bye. Thank you, thank you. Okay. So um, we've heard there from uh, the uh, ECB supervisory board. I think there are a lot of uh, interesting points made in Shirsten's speech. I mean, to mention that, of course, um, this is being live streamed, which means it will be available uh, for you to watch later. Again, if you want to absorb all of that detail there, um, as we understand it, the, the ECB are also likely to publish um, her speech on their website, which means we may expect to be able to see a transcript of that, um, if you want to read that as well, and reflect on some of the key uh, matters that Shirstin has brought up, uh, both for the European banking sector, but also for um, the internal audit profession.